The period 1934 to 1939 is widely regarded as being one of motorsport's great periods. The German Mercedes-Benz and Auto Union teams were powerful, fast and spectacular. Crowds all over Europe flocked to see this tremendous spectacle. This all ended dramatically with the declaration of war in 1939. As soon as the Second World War ended in 1945, motor racing was soon reintroduced. The German teams were in trouble, their survival being more important than motor racing. The Italians had evidently not taken the war too seriously and soon started to race works cars. Alfa Romeo brought out the 158, which had been mothballed during the war while Maserati used their pre-war 4CL. The Alfa 158, known as the Alfetta with its blown 1.5 eight-cylinder engine, was to dominate Grand Prix racing for the next five years. It was driven mainly by older pre-war drivers during this period. Achille Vazzi, Can Felice Trossi, Giuseppe Farina, Jean-Pierre Vimille. Alfa Romeo's only defeat was at St. Cloud on the outskirts of Paris, when both cars retired, leaving Raymond Sommer the winner in his Maserati. Maserati replaced the 4CL with the 4CLT, a new development of the 4CL. The 4CLT became known as the San Remo in 1948. Maserati could call on Luigi Villaresi, Alberto Ascari, Farina when he wasn't driving for Alfa, De Graffenried, Bira, Parnell and a future star, Juan Manuel Fangio. The French, with Bugatti no more, had to depend on Tony Lago's four and a half litre unblown Talbot Lago. These, driven by Chiron, Rosier, Sommer, Etaslin, and the Belgian Johnny Clays, won the occasional race by virtue of their better fuel consumption. Patriotic British drivers had to make do with the pre-war ERAs, which luckily complied with the new Formula One regulations. A British Grand Prix car had not won a race for over 20 years. In these difficult post-war days, even new cars were mostly austerity versions of old pre-war models. Two exceptions to this were Jaguar, superbly led by Sir William Lyons, who produced the XK120 for the 1948 London Motor Show. The 120 went on to win the first one-hour production race at Silverstone in 1949 and was being prepared for better things in 1950. While Jaguar were going along with their route to success, David Brown, the gear maker from Huddersfield, had bought their rivals Aston Martin and was preparing a motor racing program. Meanwhile in Italy, momentous events were taking place. Enzo Ferrari, erstwhile head of Alfa Romeo's pre-war racing, was now building his own cars at Maranello. He started with a small two-litre sports car powered by a V12 designed by Colombo. In 1948, a Ferrari driven by Clemente Beondetti won the Milamilia, and in 1949, Luigi Cianetti and Lord Selsden won Le Mans. Ferrari then decided to challenge his former mentors Alfa Romeo in Grand Prix racing and built a one and a half litre V12 blown Grand Prix car which was driven with some success by Alberto Ascari in 1949. Alfa Romeo had been totally dominant in Grand Prix racing, but they'd withdrawn at the end of the season due to lack of opposition and the loss of three of their drivers, Jean-Pierre Vimille, Achille Vazze and Count Felice Trossi. Britain's lack of a competitive Grand Prix car was taken up by Raymond Mays and Peter Burton, who'd both played an important part in the formation of the ERA project pre-war. It was Raymond Mays' dream to build a Grand Prix car which would trance the continental opposition. Mays not only found time to race and hill climb his old ERA, he also revived his pre-war dream. Although it seemed hopeless at the time to try and start such a project, his initial success in persuading the toughest of Britain's engineers and businessmen to assist the project was amazing. The assistance offered was either in cash or kind, 
and a trust was set up to administrate the project in 1948. Peter Burton and the BRM design team opted for a very ambitious one and a half litre twin overhead camshaft V16 with two stage centrifugal superchargers built by Rolls-Royce. Due to its complicated design and to shortages of materials, its development was seriously delayed with a multitude of problems discovered while testing its overly complex engine. This meant that instead of being ready for the start of racing in 1949, it couldn't be ready to make its racing debut until 1950. Raymond Mays demonstrated the new car to the British press at Falkingham Airfield, near to the BRM factory at Bourne in Lincolnshire, watched by the elder statesman of British motor racing, Earl Howe. For the 1950 season, the FIA decided to instigate a Drivers' World Championship. It was decided that the first year, the National Grand Prix of Britain, Monaco, Switzerland, Belgium, France and Italy would be qualifying rounds, along with the annual 500 miles race at Indianapolis in America. Each year since then, the championship has been awarded on a point system, based on the results of the qualifying races. For the period 1950 to 1959, the points for each race were 8 for a win, 6, 4, 3 and 2. Those for the first five finishers, plus one point for the fastest lap. Up to 1957, if more than one driver shared a car, they shared the points. The first event was the RAC British Grand Prix at Silverstone, and it was called the Grand Prix de Europe. The event was honored with the presence of the royal family, led by King George VI, Queen Elizabeth, Princess Margaret, and Lord Louis Mountbatten. The BRM was not ready to take part in the race, however, but Raymond Mays completed a number of demonstration laps, and the car was later shown to the royal family. The drivers and race officials were presented to King George prior to the race. In the absence of the Ferrari team and the BRMs, the Alpha team were the favourites for the race. The team of drivers was very strong, led by Dr Giuseppe Farina, known to his friends as Nino. He had a long and successful career, spanning the years 1934 to 1955. Farina drove for the works Alfa Romeo team pre-war. Although outpaced by the superior German opposition, he drove hard and fast. His driving was fearless and ruthless. He had numerous accidents. He was always the master of the machinery, but the car had to be built strongly for Farina was hard on a car. Farina's laid-back driving style with his arms out straight was in sharp contrast to most Grand Prix drivers of his day, who tended to crouch over the wheel. He returned to drive for Alfa Romeo after the war in 1946 with some success. When Alfa withdrew from racing in 1949, they quarreled with him and he went to drive for Maserati and Ferrari before returning to Alfa Romeo in 1950. Farina was joined at Alfa by Juan Manuel Fangio, the great Argentinian. Born at Balcace in Argentina on the 24th of June 1911, he was trained as a mechanic before taking up long-distance racing in home-built cars. In 1940, he won the 5,900-mile Grand Premio del Norte outright, becoming Argentinian national champion for 1940 and 1941. He came to Europe for the first time in 1948 at the instigation of Achille Vazze, buying a 4CLT Maserati which he took back to Argentina. He returned to Europe in 1949 with the Maserati and had a very successful season, winning at Albi, Marseille, Pau, Monza, San Remo and Perpignan. These successes led to him being invited to join the Alfa Romeo team for 1950 at the age of 38. The third regular member of the team in 1950 was Luigi Fagioli, a pre-war star with Alfa Romeo, Maserati, Mercedes-Benz and Auto Union. Although 52, he was still a capable driver. And for the British Grand Prix, there was a guest driver, Britain's Reg Parnell. 
From the start of the race, Farina took the lead, followed dutifully by Fangio, Fagioli and Parnell, watched intently by the royal family. Farina dominated the race, followed closely by Fangio. The opposition was left behind. Chiron's Talbo and Bira's Maserati having to retire. The Alphas came in for their pit stops to refuel, still retaining their lead. Towards the end of the race, Fangio came into the pits and the mechanics took one look at the engine and he retired with valve trouble. Frina carried on to win the race from his teammates Fagioli and Parnell. A happy Farina, with nine points, took the lead in the first world championship. If you already know that tender, marbled Wagyu beef makes the best burgers, Arby's is right there with you. Have an Arby's Wagyu Steakhouse burger, you beef genius. Arby's, we have the meat. Shall we begin? Step one. Two. Three. That's perfectly normal. It's an honor. Here we go. Why are you so handsome? My dad was a weatherman. That sounds big. It's been on my vision board for years. I found this flaw. There's a loophole that the lottery didn't see, and I won $15,000. The more we bet, the better the odds. We're betting half a million. <laughs> go big or go home. Are you guys drug dealers? We're professional lottery players. That isn't a thing. It is now. Jerry and Marge go large. Rated PG-13. For every action, there's a Pluto TV reaction. Hot damn. Your operation for now. You can't stop it. Watch our most explosive channel yet, only on Pluto TV. And here we go. Are you ready for some fun? Critics rave. Sonic 2 delivers on all fronts. Oh, goody. It's action-packed. Better buckle up. Hilarious and full of fun. It's been on my vision board for years. Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Ready PG. Now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. The Jaguar team, having had some success in 1949, decided to build some special XK120s for the 1950 season. And we then built... a. a five XK120s, which we dished out to people we thought would do some good and were rather carefully prepared. And of course did very well, like Appleyard, who won the Alpine, and uh, the other cars, one we lent to BM Detti, who went in the Targa Florian, the Mira Emilia, which was instructive. And the other to Nick Haynes, who was uh, this car out here, was a Belgian distributor, or joint distributor in Belgium. And he used it at Le Mans. Johnson used his for Le Mans a number of reasons and uh, to Peter Walker. You drove this race, I understand, in a lounge suit, dressed properly for the occasion. That is a very old question. Uh, my normal suit was a, uh, that kind of suit. So was the one in which I felt uh, in the best condition. While with a very big, uh, this, I would be scratching my ears uh, on doing something else. And in uh, the race, if you must be fast, you need a very high concentration and to feel yourself, only yourself. Looking back on those millimilias that you won, Ferraris then were reckoned to be cars that were quite difficult to drive, quite temperamental. Did they give you any troubles? Was there any part of the race that you thought, this is the part I like most, this is the part I don't like? Where did you take care of the car? The pilot must, must fight anyhow some difficulties. Uh, there are the same difficulties that your competitor finds. So, of course, you find difficulties. And uh, the problem is if you think and you have the exact sensibility, you do your best without destroying yourself and the car. Do you still drive a Ferrari today? I drove the Ferrari last time in 154. And after I drove normal cars, uh, I don't care of the speed. Uh, I'm not afraid of the speed, uh, but I don't feel anymore 
the same uh, excitement I found when I went 310 kilometers per hour 45 years ago. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much for looking after us so well here. Thank you. The battle for the World Championship moved on to the Principality of Monaco for round two. Fangio went into an immediate lead, while Farina spun and caused a multiple accident, which eliminated eight cars. Fangio threaded his way through the wreckage and went on to win the race. At the International Trophy at Silverstone, BRM, despite numerous development problems, had decided they must enter. One car was entered, which was flown in at the last moment, too late for practice. It was arranged for the driver, veteran Frenchman Raymond Sommer, to complete three laps to qualify. Sommer completed the three laps and took up his position on the back of the grid. As the flag was dropped, the field roared off. As Sommer let in the clutch, a drive shaft failed and the car coasted slowly to a stop. If BRM's failure was a blow for the crowd, they had some consolation from Sterling Moss's drive in the 2-litre Formula 2 HWM, Moss finishing in a superb sixth place. The HWM team was formed in 1948 by John Heath and pre-war driver George Abacassis, the owners of Hersham and Walton Motors. Originally built as two-seater sports cars in 1949 and 1950, they could be raced as single-seaters if you took off the mudguards. They were perfectly prepared by Al Francis. These simple little cars were driven by the likes of Moss and Lance Macklin. Uh, John Heath had seen me drive and he was he was quite uh, sufficiently impressed that he came to me and said, look, would you drive for my team, which was a, a really a Formula 2 team of HWMs. And I asked him what it entailed and he said, well, it entails going around Europe racing at these various races. And I thought it sounded fantastic. And it really was, I mean, a wonderful life that, that nobody could duplicate now. I mean, the, the, it just couldn't happen now. The whole world's changed too much, and the world of motor racing as well. So I joined John Heath at a very tender age, sort of 18, 19 years old, and then went abroad. And I think it was probably then when I could see the enormous pleasure. The, I mean, it was, it was my sport anyway. I enjoyed the exhilaration of driving, but to be able to have the the pleasure of going from one race to another and having these fantastic circuits. I mean, they're all road circuits. They weren't race tracks as we know them. There were one or two, I mean, Goodwood and so on, but basically they're on the roads. And uh, when I say roads, I mean, of course, closed circuits around a place like Aixley Band, they'd close off three or four miles of the, of the town, or one and a half miles, depending where it was, like Monaco more. And uh, the life was a fantastic life, really. I mean, we'd go, we'd travel, um, pro, you know, all around Europe in a car, uh, go to like a circus. We'd go from, say, Mete or somewhere down to Bari in southern Italy. We'd drive down there with John Heath in his car, stopping on the way at, at cheap, cheap places, but very nice and uh, get down there and be reasonably faces as you can imagine because this was the, their big race for the area even if it was only a small race it was still a big deal for the area we're in and uh, then they'd have you know party for the drivers and then we had the, the fantastic fun of racing two days practice usually early in the morning uh, before the town sort of got going or the market whatever uh, the roads would be closed with straw bales and then, of course, the race on Sunday. And then Sunday night, there'd be a big do we had to go to to pick up our start money. If you didn't go, you didn't get your money, you know, which was fair enough. And then the next day on the Monday, we'd probably mosey off and say, OK, we'll see, see the mechanics, usually our Francis and co, Tony Robinson people, and say, well, you know, we'll see you next weekend at wherever it was we were going to, maybe back up north or maybe keep down south. And it was just a wonderful life. Germany in 1950 was just beginning to recover from the devastation of the Second World War. The German Grand Prix returned, although it was only for Formula 2 cars. German drivers could only compete in Germany at this time. Formula 2 was a popular formula, catering for unblown cars of 2 litres. The car to beat was the 2-litre V12 Ferrari of Alberto Ascari, which easily won the race leaving the HWM's, Maserati's, Gordini's far behind. If you already know that tender, marbled Wagyu beef makes the best burgers, 
Arby's is right there with you. Have an Arby's Wagyu Steakhouse Burger. You beef genius? Arby's, we have the meat. The finals, where the perfect season can get blocked in a heartbeat. With all this on the line, you gotta be locked in. Because when the champagne stops popping, you know what's left? Legendary status, my man. Yes, Dirk. And it all starts here. Now that you can get anything on Uber Eats, you're probably wondering, can I eat anything I get delivered? Well, here's how to know. Look at it. And if it's food, eat it. And if it's not food, don't eat it. Don't, don't eat it. Is anybody confused by this? Like, what kind of fool would eat soap? Oh, it's getting bubbly. So many bubbles. the best of MTV's hit programming on MTV Pluto TV. Well, hello there. With shows like 16 and Pregnant. What is that? Monster baby in there. <laughs> Punked. Let's not go. What the hell did you do? You got a man in here. Cribs. Welcome to my crib. And are you the one? I'm husband material. You definitely want your MTV Pluto TV. I'm going to explode rainbows and butterflies and unicorns. Watch all of your favorites on MTV Pluto TV. Ascari had a lot to live up to. His father, Antonio Ascari, was European champion in 1925. Alberto Ascari was seven when his father was killed in an Alfa Romeo at Montlhéry. Like his father, he always wanted to become a Grand Prix driver. He grew up a devout Roman Catholic and a family man. He was, however, inordinately superstitious, which always amused his friend Fangio who was more practical and pragmatic. He started racing motorcycles in 1937 before driving Enzo Ferrari's first car, the Fiat-based 815, in the Milamedia in 1940. After the war, he joined Maserati, where he drove and made friends with veteran driver Luigi Villaresi. Ascari was a great natural driver who learned a great deal from Villaresi. After winning the San Remo Grand Prix in the new 4CLT Maserati in 1948, along with Villaresi, he left to drive for Enzo Ferrari's more ambitious team. By 1950, Ascari had become a great driver and would take the battle to Alfa Romeo for Ferrari. The 1950 Le Mans 24 Hours was the end of an era. The cars competing were mainly of pre-war design, Talbots. Delahays, Delages. The Aston Martin team had decided that they were going to win Le Mans. David Brown's first step towards this ambition was to take on John Wire as team manager. They ran in 1949, and uh, John Easton Gibson was team manager, and David Brown wasn't altogether happy with that arrangement. And then, he, in the beginning of 1950, he invited me. He asked me if I'd take over the team management. And I agreed to do that for one year, and in the end I stayed there for 13 years. It's a very long, temporary job. The start and the pre-war Bentleys of Hay and Hall get away. In the race, the Johnson Hadley XK120 was third before its retirement, leaving the best Jaguar to finish 12th. Aston Martin had a better result. The Abacassis Macklin DB2 finished fifth, won the three-litre class, and the prestigious index of performance while Parnell and Brackenberry were in sixth place. The race was won by Louis Rosier and his son in a four and a half litre Talbot. Lofty England of Jaguar had decided that Le Mans was there to be won. Bill Haynes and I went over just to see the race and we came away with the conclusion that if we went back the next day, because those days you understand that nobody had come out with a mod really modern, properly streamlined sports racing car. If we went back and we used our standard units in effect, engine, axle, gearbox, in a lightweight, lighter weight frame with a properly designed aerodynamic body, we could win this race. 
I went back and he then took about three months to convince Sir William to do the job. In the meantime, he got hold of Sayer, you've heard of, Malcolm Sayer, who was this aerodynamist at Bristol. I remember very well Bill Haynes, for many months he had in his office the, the, the frame of the C-type done in matchsticks. This was the development department, you know. The BRM team had been working hard on the V16 and decided to enter the car for the Goodwood August Bank Holiday meeting. The event took place in appalling wet weather, which should really not have suited the big BRM. Reg Parnell, however, was the king of Goodwood and gave the car and its supporters some cause for hope when he controlled the powerful BRM beautifully and won the race easily from Prince Bira's Maserati. Meanwhile, Farina had won the Swiss Grand Prix at Bern, and Fangio had won the Belgian and the French Grand Prix. The French Grand Prix had seen the debut of the new unsupercharged Ferrari, powered by a 3.3-litre version of the new V12 single-head camshaft unblown engine. For the Italian Grand Prix, Ferrari had a 4.5-litre engine car for Ascari and a 3.3-litre engine car for Dario Serafini. Ascari gave the Alpha team their biggest fright for years. He qualified second and took the lead on lap 14 and led till he retired on lap 22. Fangio retired two laps later while Ascari took over Serafini's Ferrari to finish second. Fagioli was third. Farina, however, won the race by more than a minute and the world championship by three points, with Fangio second and Fagioli third. So Dr. Giuseppe Farina became the first FIA world champion driver. Like many subsequent world champions, he was not the fastest driver of his era, but he won the title and could still be very quick on his day. BRM, their spirits bolstered by Reg Parnell's victory at Goodwood, had decided to enter for the Peña Rin Grand Prix at Barcelona, the Spanish Grand Prix. Alfa Romeo decided not to enter, so BRM's opposition was the Ferrari team of Ascari, Serafini and Pierre Taruffi with the four and a half litre cars. Although tremendously fast on the straight, Parnell being timed at 185 miles an hour, the BRMs were slower around the corners than the Ferraris. In the race, both BRMs were slow off the line. Peter Walker's car stalled and Reg Parnell was 19th, but up to fourth place before his supercharger drive failed. Walker, meanwhile, fought his way up to fourth place. When he came into fuel, he was behind the three Ferraris. Taruffi spun and lost two laps. Walker, battling with a down-on-power engine, eventually had to retire on lap 33 with a gearbox problem. Ferrari, meanwhile, had ended their 1950 season on a high, with a first, second and third, Ascari, Serafini, Terofi. Enzo Ferrari, in his den at Maranello, now believed that his cars could beat Alfa. It was only a question of when. BRM, on the other hand, had obviously a great deal of development work to do, especially to improve their road holding. 1951 was looking as if it was going to be one of the great years of Grand Prix racing, with the Alfa Romeo and Ferrari teams busy preparing for the forthcoming battle. While in sports car racing, Jaguar and Aston Martin were preparing to take on the world. Alfa Romeo were trying to squeeze the last drops of power from the magnificent straight eight engine. In Type 159 form, the engine produced 404 brake horsepower and consumed fuel at the rate of one and a half miles per gallon, using a very rich mixture to give better internal cooling. Even with a full 65 gallon tank, two or more pit stops would be needed to complete a full Grand Prix distance. Ferrari, meanwhile, had developed a new 24 plug head for their four and a half litre. It gave them an extra 500 RPM. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Catch the best of MCB's hit programming on MTV Pluto TV. Well, hello there.
With shows like 16 and Pregnant. What is that? Monster baby in there. <laughs> Punked. Let's not go. What the hell did you do? You got a man in here. <laughs> Cribs. Welcome to my crib. And are you the one? I'm husband material. You definitely want your MTV Pluto TV. I'm gonna explode rainbows and butterflies and unicorns. Watch all of your favorites on MTV Pluto TV. found this flaw. There's a loophole that the lottery didn't see, and I won $15,000. The more we bet, the better the odds. We're betting half a million. <laughs> go big or go home. Are you guys drug dealers? We're professional lottery players. That isn't a thing. It is now. Jerry and Marge go large. Rated PG-13. Shall we begin? Step one, two, three. That's perfectly normal. It's an honor. Here we go. Why are you so handsome? My dad was a weatherman. That sounds big. It's been on my vision board for years. The racing season in Britain got off to its usual start at Goodwood on Easter Monday. Reg Parnell was there as usual with his Maserati, but his main opposition was to come from Prince Bira, who had put a 4.5-litre V12 Oscar engine designed by the Maserati brothers into his old 4CLT Maserati. Bira tried to persuade me to be his manager in 1950-51. Uh, there was a dreadful machine called the Oscar, which was a 4CLT Maserati with a 4.5 litre Oscar engine, which slightly predated the 4.5 litre Ferrari, and it really was a dreadful thing. Uh, Birra brought it to uh, 1951 Goodwood, uh, very late, and we had all sorts of trouble with it. We couldn't get the oil system to prime because uh, had Castrol R in a tank in the tail, and Goodwood at Easter is not a warm place. And we had a five-gallon drum of oil hanging from a tree with an oxyacetylene torch warming it so that the oil would circulate, and uh, it rained, and we had to get Dunlops to mount Pirelli tyres, and it jumped out of gear. And I got into trouble with the landlady of the ship hotel because Birra had two young ladies in his bed at breakfast, and it was all very difficult. In the first race, Birra had plug problems, which allowed Parnell to win in his Maserati. Birra was working on his car on the grid and slow away at the start, but he soon caught Parnell and passed him. Birra then started to pull away. Parnell overstressed the 4CLT's engine which expired, leaving Birra to win the Oscars' only victory. The next event of the season was the Daily Express International Trophy at Silverstone, and it was eagerly awaited. Ferrari withdrew his entry at the last moment. It was a pity when Reg Parnell's performance in Tony Vanderbilt's 1950 Thin Wall Special is considered. The Thin Wall Special was destined to become Britain's most famous Formula Libra racing car over the next few years. In the first heat, Fangio ran out the winner from Alpha, but Parnell had driven a fine race to finish second. The second heat went to Farina's Alpha from teammate Sanesi at a faster pace. The final was eagerly awaited with the prospect of a battle between Farina, Fangio and Parnell. As the cars were wheeled out against a backdrop of threatening clouds, it started to rain with that devastating suddenness for which Silverstone is now famous. The course was flooded with rain and hail and the darkness lit up by the lightning. 
visibility for drivers was nil. Cars went off in all directions. The rain and the hail was difficult for anyone to drive in. Bonetto led for Alpha on the first lap, but was passed by Parnell and Duncan Hamilton's Talbot. Fangio worked his way up to third when the race was stopped after five laps, with Reg Parnell declared the winner. This meeting was nearly the end of Roy Salvadori's promising career, when he had a devastating accident at Stowe Corner in his Fraser Nash in the sports car race. Conditions were no better for the Swiss Grand Prix at Bern. Fangio made the most of the conditions leading throughout. Then at the Belgian Grand Prix at Spa, Frina, inspired by a victory at Dundrod, was in tremendous form. Villaresi took the lead for Ferrari, but Farina soon passed him and went on to win with Ascari second and Villaresi third. Both Aston Martin and Jaguar had set their sights on Le Mans. Jaguar had more cause for optimism. Their new C-Type with its powerful six-cylinder double overhead camshaft engine was in with a chance for overall honors. Aston Martin, on the other hand, were handicapped by only having a 2.6-litre engine, the ex Lagonda engine designed by W.O. Bentley, which didn't develop enough power. Jaguar entered three cars, for Peter Walker and Peter Whitehead, Sterling Moss and Jack Thurman, Clemente Bayandetti and Leslie Johnson. Aston Martin entered three cars for Lance Macklin and Eric Thompson, George Abacassis and Brian Shaw Taylor, Reg Parnell and David Hampshire plus two private entrants, all in DB2s. In the race, Jaguar took the battle to the opposition. Sterling Moss, driving at Le Mans for the first time, set off in the lead, driving at a prearranged speed. As the evening wore on, the C-type of Johnston Bear Litty broke an oil pipe, lost its oil pressure and had to retire. Eventually, the Moss car suffered the same fate, blowing up extensively. This left the Walker Whitehead car in the lead by a handsome margin over the Mare Meres Talbot. Bear in mind, this was the first race the car had ever competed in. It never competed in a 50-mile race, nothing. But we had not had this trouble in all the testing we'd done. We'd done a lot of testing. But we'd never done any testing where you were able to hold the thing on full bash for three miles like you are in Le Mans. This was the answer. And the sump, of course, was different on this thing. So it had a different oil delivery pipe from the pump up to leading up to the filter area, which had been done in copper. And there was just a very little slight vibration period, about five, seven or something like that. And this was enough to just shatter this pipe and it broke off. That's the answer to that one. And the first one happened was Biandetti, who was an old timer, and he saw the oil pressure go like this. So he actually got it round to the pit without dropping a bearing. But there was nothing we could do about it. The second one was with Moss, which was in the dark about 11 o'clock at night, pouring with rain, he didn't obviously see the oil gauge, and the rod came out the side. So then after that, we, we knew what it was, so we just, we got a hell of a lead with the other car, so we just slowed it down and kept it under this critical RPM and prayed. Jaguar and Aston Martin were lucky to have team managers of the caliber of England and Wyoming. If Alfred Neiber of Mercedes was commonly regarded as the greatest team manager of all time, England and Wire were not far behind him. Both were supreme at the strategic and tactical control of a race, and more than capable of controlling determined drivers. Both men set target times for their drivers. This meant that a car would be given a set lap time for the drivers to aim at, which was carefully calculated to keep the car in contention. If later in the race it was possible to improve the car's position, it could be speeded up. The thing to be avoided at all cost was driving too fast, too soon, and overstretching the machinery. The Macklin Thompson Aston Martin, meanwhile, was climbing up through the field and moved into third place. Peter Walker and Peter Whitehead drove a good race, just fast enough and took a well-deserved win. Aston Martin also had a successful time, finishing third, fifth, seventh, 10th, and 13th. The Macklin Thompson car, which finished third overall, won the 3 litre class. The Nash Healy of Tony Rolt and Duncan Hamilton finished sixth, 
following up their fourth place achieved in 1950. We only raced for one purpose, and that, that was to get publicity, free publicity. And the pu free publicity you only get by getting the front page of the News of the World or Daily Express or something, or radio and TV. And of course, when we won the bond the first time, 51, we got all that, all for nothing, which we could never have bought. And that was the thing which really put Jaguar on the map. Export wise. Up to that time, I used to go to America and they stopped me and say, What is this car you have there? They didn't know. After we won Le Mans, they knew what Jaguar was. It was just like that overnight. Round four of the 1951 world title was at Reims in the Champagne district of France. Battle recommenced between Alfa Romeo and Ferrari. A new driver joined Ferrari at this stage, Jose Freulin Gonzalez. Gonzalez, like Bernd Rossemeyer, the great pre-war Auto Union driver, burst across the European scene like a star, achieving fame almost in the twinkling of an eye, and then departed almost as suddenly as he arrived. The ability to reshape the result of a race against the odds ultimately shows a driver's greatness. Fangio, Ascari and Farina were capable of this, and so was Gonzalez. They could take a race by the scruff of the neck and turn the result upside down. In 1951, Freudan Gonzalez had his chance and seized it with both hands. It's doubtful if there was a faster or more determined driver in this period, or one who learned to go so fast so quickly. At the start of the French Grand Prix in 1951, Fangio and Ascari both made good starts and battled for the lead. Both retired in the early stages. Fangio took over Fagioli's car and Ascari the car of Gonzalez. Farina had to retire. Eventually Fangio retook the lead to win from Ascari and Villaresi. The French Grand Prix was the beginning of the end for Alpha. They might still be faster and have better brakes, but their extra pit stop for fuel was a distinct disadvantage. On the slower circuits, there was every chance that they would not be able to make up the time to allow for this. The British Grand Prix at Silverstone would prove the point. Once again, the Silverstone crowds waited to see the Ferraris, to see whether they could beat Alfa Romeo. BRM chose this race to make one of their rare appearances. They were to be overshadowed, however, by the efforts of Gonzalez. He caused a sensation in practice and banner headlines in the Daily Express when he set the first 100 miles per hour lap. Race day was to be dramatic. The 1951 British Grand Prix was dominated by the Ferrari Alfa Romeo battle and the win for Freudin Gonzalez. Behind, however, the BRMs were to give quite a good account of themselves. They struggled through the field, one of them getting past one of the Alfa Romeos. But for the drivers, it was a far from comfortable ride, as Tony Rudd explains. Uh, yes, well, the exhaust system ran along the floor of the thing, and uh, nobody had ever managed to drive it for more than about 50 miles at a time. So to finish a Grand Prix, you know, we were breaking new ground. And it did fry the drivers. I can remember uh, at the pit stop, Parnell saying to Peter Burton, it's burning me. Peter Burton said, never mind, get back in the car. So he did. And uh, the next pit stop, I'd catch some cotton wool from the first aid people and soak them in aquaflavine. So we gave him some aquaflavine soaked cotton wool plus fours. I don't think it made any difference, but uh, <laughs> made us feel better. The BRMs finished fifth and seventh. Both drivers were burned, Walker almost to the point of collapse. Gonzalez won the race, and here is Walker's exhausted face as he climbs out of the car. It's perhaps a measure of this much underrated driver's greatness that this tremendous win was achieved in his first full Grand Prix season and with a car with which he was not overly familiar. A fortnight later, it was the turn of the German Grand Prix on the formidable Nürburgring. Ascari was fastest in practice from the irrepressible Gonzalez with Fangio third. At the start, Fangio fought it out with Ascari and Gonzalez, both of whom passed Fangio when he stopped for fuel. Fangio fought back to retake the lead before having to make his second stop, 
When he returned to the fray, he had gearbox problems and couldn't catch Ascari, having to be content with second place. Gonzalez finished third. Before the Italian Grand Prix, Fangio led the World Championship with 27 points, from Ascari with 17. Verena and Gonzalez had 15 points. Alfa entered four cars, Fangio, Verena, Benetto and Emmanuel de Graffenried, while Ferrari had entered five cars, Ascari, Villaresi, Gonzalez, Piera Taruffi and Chico Landi, the Brazilian. BRM appeared and entered two cars for Reg Parnell and Chief Mechanic Ken Richardson, whose experience was very limited. BRM had all sorts of problems. The RAC refused to let Richardson race. On the morning prior to the race, Hans Stock, the pre-war Auto Union driver, was invited to try the car, but he damaged the gearbox. The end result was that the BRMs non-started. They retired in public disgrace to the whistles of the crowd. It was to have far-reaching consequences for the future of the Grand Prix formula. The last appearance of the BRM at a Grand Prix was a miserable whimper. Fangio and Farina were fastest in practice. Fangio shot into the lead until he lost a tire tread and had to pit. This let Ascari into a lead which he was never to lose. Farina took over Benetto's car while Fangio retired. Farina caught Gonzalez for third, only to lose it again at his second pit stop. Ascari, meanwhile, had a shambolic pit stop of his own, leaving the pit in disarray. Farina again caught up with Gonzalez, only to have to pit again with a split fuel tank. He flew out of the pits with a fountain of fuel streaking along the road behind him. So a weary Alberto Ascari won, followed by Gonzalez and Villaresi. A disappointed Farina was fourth. He'd driven his best race for years, really pressing on regardless. A great driver at his best, fighting the odds. There's no finer sight in motor racing. The championship, therefore, was to be decided at the last round, the Spanish Grand Prix. The race was over 70 laps, 275 miles. The Alphas planned to have two pit stops and used smaller tanks to improve the road holding. Ferrari, meanwhile, had decided to change his tires and use a smaller diameter and larger section tire. This was to prove a real error. Ascari led from the start until Fangio made his bid, caught and passed him. This led to a flat-out battle at terrific speeds, both drivers taking corners in enormous power slides within inches of the walls and rows of spectators. All good things must come to an end and all of the Ferrari drivers were afflicted with tyre problems. Only Gonzalez made any real impact on the race for Ferrari. He took Farina to take second place, but he was unable to catch Fangio. Gonzalez was heard to say, I'm satisfied to finish second. Fangio is the master. So Fangio won his first title with 31 points, from Ascari with 25 and Gonzalez with 24. Champions, they write their own storybook endings, sharing glories and moments that last forever. ESPN ABC and ESPN Plus. Champions live here. If you already know that tender marbled Wagyu beef makes the best burgers, Arby's is right there with you. Have an Arby's Wagyu Steakhouse burger. You beef genius? Arby's, we have the meat. I'm a fancy exercise bike newbie, and I've gone from zero to obsessed in like three days. Woo! Come on, Milwaukee, after me. After riding 12 miles from nowhere, I'm taking a detour. And if you don't have the right home insurance coverage, you could be working out a way to pay for this yourself. Get Allstate and be better protected from mayhem for a whole lot less. Catch the best of MTV's hit programming on MTV Pluto TV. Well, hello there. With shows like 16 and Pregnant. What is that? Monster baby in there. <laughs> Punked. Let's not go. 
you do? You got a man in here. Cribs. Welcome to my crib. And are you the one? I'm husband material. You definitely want your MTV Pluto TV. I'm gonna explode rainbows and butterflies and unicorns. Watch all of your favorites on MTV Pluto TV. I found this flaw. There's a loophole that the lottery didn't see, and I won $15,000. Here we go back. The more we bet, the better the odds. We're betting half a million. <laughs> Go big or go home. Are you guys drug dealers? We're professional lottery players. That isn't a thing. It is now. Jerry and Marge go large. Wait at PG-13. Perhaps the best historic driver of his era, Willie Green introduces us to the Type 158 Alfa Romeo, one of the great Grand Prix cars. I mean, what an incredible motor car. I suppose, well, I've said that my favorite car is a 250F Maserati, if I'd had more time with the Alpha, I think I would have probably chosen the Alpha. Um, this was a car which the design was started in the late 30s and then was resurrected and improved on for the sort of early, well, late 40s, early 50s Grand Prix. I mean, it looks big. Um, it's very strong. It's very heavy. But I think they were, I think they could carry nearly 100 gallons of fuel towards the later stages. I know when I sat in the car, you got fuel tanks on top of your legs, beside your legs, behind you, everywhere. And yet when you drove the car, it felt so tiny and so light, and you could drive it with your fingertips. It was absolutely beautiful to drive. The amazing thing about the engine was, this is a two-stage supercharged one and a half litre. And it was a little like driving a turbocharged car on the initial application of power you would suddenly get a, a, a large surge of power as the second stage of the supercharger came into operation. So you had to be a little bit careful coming out of slow corners. But then when the power came in at sort of four and a half thousand revs, it flew. For a big heavy car, it was incredible. It was, the normal rev limit was 8,000. There again, factory records show that 9,000 was used fairly regularly. Although it wasn't absolutely necessary, it just went like hell. But how did it compare with the car that was made with the full intention of taking it on and beating it, the BRM? God, what a contrast. I mean, I was incredibly lucky to drive the Alfa Romeo car at the Alfa Romeo test track at Bolocco. And then the next week, I drove the V16 at Donington in England. Now, the thing that everybody remembers about the V16 was the noise, which of course is shattering. And it's perhaps its best feature. <laughs> um, the car, by comparison, is undrivable. Uh, the engine is quite docile up until 6,000 revs. And then for, sort of, for every 1,000 rev increase above 6, the power doubles. So that you cannot control the power as you try to feed it to the wheels, because every time you give it a little bit more throttle, you've got about twice as much power as you expected. Combined with a chassis, which is one of the worst I've ever used, the, I mean... One of the only guys ever to really tame the car was Fangio, and he only managed it because, because of who he was. By the way, what are our man's credentials? Well, he was recognised as possibly the best of all historic car drivers, and had he bothered to, could have been a Grand Prix star in his youth. One of the few drivers of the era who spoke English and drove for Alfa Romeo was the Baron Emmanuel de Grappenry. I had a chance to talk with him about driving the car. Yeah. Oh, that was, well, of course, I was very lucky to drive in 50 and uh, 51 or so, I think, also. The Alfetta 159 and the Alfetta 158. I started in the Geneva with the Grand Prix des Nations, with uh, Fangio, myself, and Taruffi. And very luckily there I came in second behind Fangio. For me, it was again a great honor, but in these days, uh, driving a... If you want, driving uh, the 158 or the 159, I suppose it's like today driving the top uh, Formula One car, or, or the Williams or, uh, or Ferrari.
During the winter of 1951-2, the future of Grand Prix racing was being assessed. Would Alfa Romeo continue? Would Mercedes-Benz return to racing with their pre-war W168 V8 supercharged car? How reliable would the BRN be? Would it turn up if entered? The race organizers were in a difficult position at the start of the season, with Alfa finally announcing their withdrawal from motor racing. This, together with the failure of BRM to turn up in a race-worthy condition at the beginning of 1952, left Formula One in a very lopsided condition, with only Ferrari with a truly competitive car. This lingering doubt convinced Mercedes to concentrate on designing a new car for the new Formula One to take effect in 1954. So one by one, the Grand Prix organizers went over to Formula Two, and eventually the FIA followed suit leaving BRM to reflect on what might have been. Fangio's win in Barcelona in 1951 was the last win for a supercharged car until the advent of the turbocharged era of the 1980s. The 1948-51 Grand Prix formula perhaps relied more on brute force than sophisticated design, but it gave motor racing at the time when it needed it the thunder to thrill the spectators and re-establish motorsport as a public spectacle. Meanwhile, the Grand Prix teams were preparing for the new season. An entirely new Ferrari had been produced. Designed by Aurelio Lampredi, the new Typo 500 had a two-litre four-cylinder engine. Maserati had revitalized their team with the introduction of the A6 GCM. This six-cylinder car, capable of delivering 165 horsepower, incorporated a simple tubular chassis with rigid rear axles similar to the old San Remo car. French hopes now rested solely on Gordini. The most significant development on the British motor racing scene in 1952, however, was the development of the Bristol engine. John and Charles Cooper made the decision to build a front-engined Grand Prix car 